Welcome to In Focus. Is aid effective? Should we end it? As we think of new ways of conceiving development, is it time also to think of new ways of financing that development? And what would this mean? Well, to help answer some of these questions, we're joined by Professor Justin Yifu Lin, the founder and director of the China Economic Research Center at Peking University. Professor Lin is also the former chief economist and senior vice president at the World Bank. Professor Lin, welcome to the program. My pleasure. And welcome to Tanzania. Well, I love the country. Uh, just to, to start off with, um, we think of development finance largely in terms of, of aid and concessional borrowing. And this is a model that's been around for a good 60, 70 years based on this idea that there are certain common public goods that everyone should have access to. So really it's been in some ways a subsidy, in some ways a way of making sure everyone at least starts at, at, at a certain level. Um, is this premise still valid? Like, is this still the purpose of development and, and aid, as it were? I think it's certainly because, you know, we hope to have prosperity in the world. We hope to eradicate poverty. And those kind of efforts are very important, bring the improvement of well-being to the people in the low-income country and to provide the hope for the young people in the futures. And so, you know, that will contribute to the progress of the society, the stability of society, and overall that will also be important for the world peace. And if people are not happy with what they have, what they have at the country, certainly you're going to see something like a bulk people like illegal migrations. And so overall, to help the you know, developing country to grow dynamically, to fulfill the dream of the people, it's good for the recipient country, but also for the donor country. And you're here visiting us in, in Tanzania to commemorate 50 years of the Central Bank of Tanzania. You're giving a talk entitled Beyond you know, concessional borrowing and aid, new ways of financing development. Why this topic? Well, because although we have a lot of effort in the past six, 70 years, but poverty is still a big issue in the world. And uh, if you look at you know, the statistic, the historical records, in a post-World War II, most the colonies you know, obtained political independence, started to pursue their own nation's modernization. But so far, among about 200 developing economies after the World War II, only two have moved from low income to high income. One was Korea, the other one was Taiwan, China. And the mainland China may become the third one to move from low income to high income by the time of 2020. And only 13 economies move from middle income to high income. And among those 13, eight were European countries surrounding West Europe. Their gap of income was small to begin with or oil producing country. The other five were Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore. So that means that after the Second World War, in spite of so many effort by the individual countries or the global development communities, most of them have been trapped in middle income or low income. And so poverty reduction is still a challenge in the world. So we need to reflect. Even though we have so many programs with good intentions, and how come they, don't, they do not deliver, they have not delivered the you know, desirable effect of reducing poverty. 
provides prosperity. But why, why are you focusing then on financing? Surely then the challenge might be the development model, as it were, but you're, you're specifically highlighting the financing of development. Is there something specific yeah. that, that we believe is a problem there, or an issue, or it's, it's restricted it in some it. way? It debated the way of development, development models. Mm -hmm. But financing is a, a very important part of that development model. Because we know all the countries start with poor agrarian society. At that time, their productivity was low, their income was low, and most people live in poverty. And the way to move away from poverty to prosperity is to have a structural transformation. On the existing sectors they produce, like in agriculture, they need to have a stream of technological innovations and to improve the labor productivity in those sectors. Not only so, they need to have a continuous industrial upgrading to sectors which have higher value added compared to the older sectors. So you can relocate the labor force, capital, natural resources from the lower value added sectors to higher value added new sectors. And those kind of technological innovation and industrial upgrading require capital because you need to make investment. Not only so, when you move from traditional agricultural agrarian economy to modern industrial economy, the economy scale enlarge, increase and the market reach also need to be increased. So at the beginning, you produce only for local markets, and but in the modern time, you produce for national market, for international markets. Then you need to have a much better infrastructure, road, port facilities, and in modern productions, you also need to use electricity, machinery, and all those also require the infrastructure. And the improvement of infrastructure also requires capital investment. And we know low-income country, they have limited availability of capitals. So if there are some kind of foreign aids or foreign financial resources to supplement the capital availability domestically, then a low-income country will be able to have a faster technological innovation industrial upgrading, improvement in infrastructure. By that way, they can improve their income faster, reduce the poverty faster. And so that's the reason why financing is a very important component in this modernization process. Is it that concessional borrowing and aid just isn't enough? Is that why we're looking at alternatives? Or you know, is something fundamentally wrong with those two financing models that we now need I to think look for that, alternatives? Uh, that is one thing which I you know, have a reflection. Mm -hmm. Because in a post-world world, mm -hmm. at that time, every country wants to be a high-income, modernized country. And at that time, the development effort was to help the country to develop modern, large-scale, capital-intensive industries. And a lot of development aids were used for that purpose, to help the developing country set up steel mill, automobile, you know, factory, you know, all those kind of things, mm -hmm. which was the dominant sectors in high-income country at that time. But those kind of effort failed mm -hmm. because a developing country, they did not have competitive advantage in those kind of sectors. Mm -hmm. And even with the government's resources mobilization or with aids from multilateral institutions or bilateral institutions, mm -hmm. you might be able to build up those kind of sectors, but they were not competitive. So those kind of projects became white elephant. Mm -hmm. And so even you have those kind of development effort, but you did not 
achieve the goal of really making people, you know, uh, 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 prosperous. So, so what is it? was it a kind of like oversight that they didn't factor in the kind of long-term sustainability? Right. Competitiveness. And uh, so because those kind of development effort failed, mm -hmm. by the time of 1980s, the ideas changes. That time, the development communities thought, how can developing country would not perform well? Because they had too many government interventions and they create sectors which, you know, were not competitive. And so in the 1980s, the idea in the development community changed to the structural adjustment. Ask the developing country to withdraw from all kind of market interventions. But and that understand that time was that if you wanted to have a good economic performance, you should have good resource allocation by market forces. And so the government intervention was bad, and so they advised the government not to intervene anymore. And the development aid at that time was used mainly for the government to carry out those kind of structural adjustment programs. But as a result, of those kind of program was the collapse of the economy. Many old sectors, they could not compete with the government protections. And then you, you know, ask government to withdraw those kind of protection or subsidies, they just go bankrupt, causing the large unemployment, causing the instability of the economies. Then global development community changed their idea again. They see poverty still so prevalent, and they started to, you know, focus on humanitarian aids, improve education, health, and uh, on the one hand, and improve the governance on the other hand. And I think they all have good intention. But the issue is that even if we provide good health, good education programs. What will they do now? <laughs> uh, and sometimes even you build a school, but the teacher will not come. Mm -hmm. You build a clinics, but they don't have the, 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 the medicine. Okay. Even you have a school and a teacher and you have the medicine, and the people get educated and healthy, but they don't have job. And again, so it's still causing a lot of tensions. Mm -hmm. And the goal of poverty reduction, the goal of closing the gap with the income country, has not been realized. And so that is the reason why we need to have rethinking and look into those countries which were able to be successful, but then so we can learn. And that is, I try to provide in my analysis, in my talk and in my other writings. Sure. But one of the things you had mentioned there is that you know, the state is withdrawing from quite a lot of these things. So is it by implication that you need new models of financing because you have new types of actors. We need to understand first, what is the model to make the country successful? Successful in the ways that they can create jobs for the people because we know most poor people, the only asset that they can earn income to pay for their living, livings are their own labor force. Yeah. So we need to create a job for them. Not only job, we need to create a competitive job. They get a job, they can produce something which can be competitive in domestic and international markets. They all started their modernization through the development of light labor intensive manufacturing sectors. And those kind of labor intensive light manufacturing can utilize a lot of labor force, providing jobs for the people currently they are in rural areas, they were surplus labor. Their living was very poor because they did not have much income. But if you provided them with manufacturing jobs, they are employed, they can earn income. So their living can be improved. But at the same time, those kind of sectors were consistent with their competitive advantages. So they can compete in domestic market and international markets. And by that, 
they can create profit or economic surplus, they can accumulate more capital, then they can upgrade their industries, so start step, step, step by step. step. Those are the secret of success. But you know, certainly, so if the other developing country can follow that path of development, again, they can utilize what they have, a lot of labor force, into the production, and then create a job, and also produce good competitiveness, competitively. So that should be the new model of economic development. And among this new model of economic development, as I mentioned, economic development is a process of continuous structural transformation, both in terms of technology, which requires investment, in terms of industrial upgrading, which requires investment, in terms of infrastructure improvement, which also requires investment. So we need to have capital. And in this way, certainly, you know, financing would be essential because you need to have capitals. Traditional ways of an ODA oversee development assistance as a grant certainly will be welcomed. Concession alone will also be welcomed because they can put in that use will help creating job, create competitiveness. But as long as you develop your economy according to your competitive advantages, those kind of investment will generate high enough return. So you can also allow some non-concessional borrowing as long as they are used in this purpose. So that's the reason why I advocate to expand the scope of development financing. Traditionals, you know, ODAs, concessional loans, would be welcome. For example, friend that we, you know, the the foreign borrowing to support infrastructure investment that can support the, you know, industrialization, and also foreign direct investment in sectors which are consistent with your competitive advantages, that cre can create job, can create the dynamism of the growth. So those kind of things, you know, should also be included in the development financing. So is, is financing then a way of almost disciplining where you invest? So you only invest if it makes a business case to invest. Sure. Well. Good um, economic case. Yeah. <laughs> so does that, by extension, then does that mean that there, there are certain areas within broad development yeah. that are more suitable than others to different types of financing then? In some areas, it's a global public good. Mm -hmm. Then we should rely more on the conventional Development financing. For example, the the climate change dimension, mm -hmm. and to cope with the gro climate you know, changes, global warmings, you need to adopt new technologies in the uh, you know generating electricity and so on, mm -hmm. or to have a solar power and so on. Mm -hmm. Those kind of things can increase the cost of generating electricity but it contributes to the reduction of CO2. Mm -hmm. And for that, I think to have a conventional financial, different financing, like grant mm -hmm. or concessional loan, would be desirable because they produce some global public goods. Yeah. yeah. So a kind of subsidy almost. Subsidies of that, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, if it's in sectors of investment which can generate you know, competitive returns, then we can use more new type of financing, including foreign direct investment, including you know, uh, 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 the financing for trade, mm -hmm. those kind of arrangements, as long as they contribute to you know, the job creation, they contribute to the uh, competitiveness of the economy, and they provide capital for that purpose, then they are consistent with the broad definition of development financing. I mean, one of the other things that, that has often been criticized um, by various different people are these kind of international financial institutions that have overseen, to an extent, regulated um, aid and concessional borrowing. With these new models of financing, you know, how do you regulate that, or should it be regulated? How do we safeguard against some of the potential risks that come with that? For certain, that, I think there's two parts of that. Currently, 
you know, the debt sustainability is too narrow because they do not distinguish between consumption type of activity and investment type of activities. They see that, you know, uh, it's only one category. Mm -hmm. But in effect, those kind of, you know, no matter it's financial, it, it, it's uh, development aids mm -hmm. or it's government borrowings mm -hmm. can go to, let's say, health, education, or unemployment benefit, they are consumption type of activities. Mm -hmm. But you can also have the development financing or government borrowing mm -hmm. for infrastructure investment, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, this infrastructure inv investment can release the bottleneck, and then they can enhance the productivity and also the revenue in the futures. And so under this kind of situation, I think that, you know, because traditionally you do not distinguish these two different type of categories. And whenever a country reaches certain level, you know, ceiling, mm -hmm. then the Global Development Financial Institution like IMF mm -hmm. or the World Bank, mm -hmm. they would advise against mm -hmm. those kind of borrowing even they are for the purpose of investment to improve the infrastructure. So I think that we need to redefine the, you know, the, 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 des, the des sustainability issue. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. And after you de redefine, you know, to have two different components. One is pure consumption, which will not contribute to the productivity enhancement, mm -hmm. and the other which can increase productivity investment. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, enhancement. Certainly, we also need to have a regulation. We also need to have a supervision in order to enhance discipline, mm -hmm. right? And and uh, that's one one hand. And uh, secondly, we also need to have a better design of the use of these financial resources. Mm -hmm. We should put the money into area which it can really, on the one hand, reach the poor people, mm -hmm. or in area which can enhance the productivities. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's require knowledge sharing, it requires capacity buildings, mm -hmm. and also requires certain kind of discipline. So are we sure that there is additional finance available? The world is changing because we now, you know, the, the G7, the seven rich industrialized countries, they used to contribute to two-thirds of global GDP. Now they reduce down to less than one-half of the global GDP. We have new emerging market economies. Now they reach middle income, high middle income, on the way to high income countries. And certainly, they can also be sources of development financing. But their development financing part of will be in a category of conventional you know, development aids or concessional loan, but part can be also in the productivity enhancing, growth enhancing type of investment. And uh, as long as it's an investment, it generates return, and then they will have the incentive to provide those kind of financing to the developing country. Is this not slightly ideological? Because there are those who feel that you know, development in and of itself is a public good. So the idea of, of introducing sometimes quite complex financial arrangements actually is at a disadvantage to developing countries who really, in some cases, have no alternative. Development have a public good dimension, as I mentioned. It improves the well-being of the poor people. It's a common concern to everyone in the world. It, you know, contribute to the social political stability in a country and that will reduce challenges to the developed world also. So it has a public good dimension. But fundamentally, the most important recipients of this development, you know, uh, 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 we mean improvement, is the people itself, right? And so if we make an investment which create job, certainly it's good for the poor people. But as long as this investment and enhance the competitiveness of the nation, it generates return. 
And so the more that we can get the financial resources to make those kind of investment, then it will make a larger contribution to the poverty reduction and to the growth in the, in the country. But if it's an investment generate high enough return, certainly we should also provide the return to the provider of those kind of financial resources in order to encourage more of those kind of financial resources to be provided to the developing country. Sure. So it's a win-win for both sides. One, one of the questions that, that, I, that I have with this is Africa provides a lot of the world's, let's say, raw materials. Yeah. And that seems to be our so-called advantage. Now we are purposely trying to shift out of that. But that might not be what an investor wants because yeah. you need the money, but you also know that by taking the money here, you're not developing over there. So how do you balance that? Yeah, actually, I think African countries have two advantages. One is natural resources. Many countries have that, have that. The other one is large supply of labor force, especially young labor force. And uh, they should be one of the most important assets for African country. But certainly, this young labor force they can either be a demographic, a demographic dividend or demographic bonds. Depends on whether you provide competitive job or not to them. If you develop, as what I mentioned, light manufacturing labor intensive industries, then it will provide job to them and they will contribute to the economics you know, uh, 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 growth in the country. And so those kind of capital for that purpose is both for economic return, but also for development. So I think that you now for African country to diversify from the natural resources, I think this is the right idea. Because natural resources has some limitation. One, um, there's a lot of you know, cyclical movement in the prices. Yeah. Sometimes it generates high return, yeah. but other times it can you know, uh, be a challenge right, for the revenue. And secondly, it would not create much jobs. Yeah. Right? But in African continents, I think now job is the most important challenge. So to diversify from natural resources to the manufacturing sectors, starting with the light manufacturing, which generate job, which utilize your complete advantages, and I think it's one stone, kill two birds. And not only so, if you look at a few successful economies, as I mentioned, they all started with the development of labor-intensive light manufacturing. So allow them to sit, transform themselves from poor agrarian economies to modern industrialized economy. They accumulate capital, then they gradually you know, have industrial upgrading. When capital becomes, becomes more available. So I think it's you know, not only address the needs of creating jobs now, it also you know, is the right path for African country to eradicate poverty and also to enjoy the modernization as other successful countries. One of the areas we hear a lot about nowadays, and I suppose it's again almost coming back to the previous question, is this idea of trade for aid, yeah. for example. And I'd, I'd imagine you'd consider this a, a form of, of development financing. Right. Who sets those terms of what we're trading, what we're aiding? Because surely, Developing countries like Tanzania are at a disadvantage there at saying, you know, we would like to grow in this sector, but your interest is in that one because it serves your purpose. How do you, how do you get around that? You know, the old input substitution strategies and the desire to develop large scale capital intensive modern industries. Mm -hmm. The first wave of development thinking in the 1950s and uh, 1960s it's still deep, deeply rooted in many people's mind. Mm -hmm. And under this kind of situation, if you want to develop all kinds of sectors, 
which were not your competitive advantages, mm -hmm. then certainly you cannot get you know, those kind of capital through trade because they need to be protected. Yeah. But if you develop the labor intensive mm -hmm. sectors, mm -hmm. which are your competitive advantages, mm -hmm. then the investor will have the incentive to invest in those kind of sectors. Mm -hmm. The capital provider there. will also have the incentive to go into those kind of sectors. Sure. So I think that's very important that we need to have a rethinking of the development ideas. I think that in the past, the development ideas in general use the high-income country as reference mm -hmm. to look at what high-income countries have, large-scale modern industries, or what high-income country can do well, or are functioning, market institutions. And uh, as a reason to look at what the developing country do not have or could not do well. Developing country, certainly, they do not have large-scale modern capital-intensive industries. And uh, then the development ideas, otherwise the developing country do the world, those kind of industry as in high-income country. A developing country in general, their market institutions were not as in a uh, uh, well developed as in high income country, then the development ideas would advise the developing country to improve their market institution. But in general, those kind of approach did not work well. So what I'm advocating is that we should look at what the developing countries have now and what they could do well based on what they have now. Then create an enabling environment to scale up what they can do well. And then follow these ideas, then we can see actually every developing country, they can become competitive immediately as long as they have you know, a market economy with an enabling government. And then as is our custom on the program, um, is there a final word you have for our audience? I have a strong confidence <laughs> in Tanzania, in African countries. I think every country has the opportunity to grow dynamically for several decades to transform themselves from poverty to prosperity. If they develop their economies according to their comparative advantages and utilize the advantage of backwardness with an enabling government and uh, to empower the private sectors. And I think that with this kind of new ideas, mm -hmm. I'm confident that Tanzania can be transformed, Africa can be transformed, and we can say goodbye to poverty. <laughs> well, well, on that note, uh, thank you very much for coming on the program and, and welcome again soon. Very good. Thank you.